Hello, Sunday School Dropouts. Welcome to our first episode of 2024. Oh my gosh, it is wild to believe that we are in a new year. Um, to be quite honest, I have no idea where the last year went. I, it is hard for me to believe that um, a full calendar year has, has come and gone. And here we are in 2024. So hopefully by the time that y'all are listening to this, maybe you are feeling a little bit more grounded after the holidays, or you feel, um, or maybe you're actually looking for some support after having a tumultuous holiday season. Nevertheless, I am glad you're here. But really quickly, before we get into today's episode, I want to just kind of mention that because um, there's kind of this uh, funny little anecdote from therapy world, like when I talk to other therapists, and I believe there's actually some research around this as well, that January is oftentimes the busiest month for therapists and divorce attorneys. <laughs> Most people try to get through the holidays before they might seek out a divorce attorney. And so January is that time of year. But in terms of therapy and coaching, January is oftentimes very busy because a whole slew of you have just spent a lot of time with your fa family in close corridors. And those family dynamics are just right up in your face, whether that's triggering or bringing up old memories or whatever that might be. And so if that is you, I just want to remind you that the Center for Trauma Resolution and Recovery, who sponsors uh, and produces this podcast, is available for support. We have practitioners that are ready to work with you um, through that, whether that's religious trauma, family trauma, uh, systems of power and control, narcissistic parents, siblings, friends, relationships, all sorts of things. And so if that is something you are looking for, please head over to our site, which is traumaresolutionandrecovery.com and schedule your free inquiry call with a coach of your choice. So I'm really excited because now that the holidays are done, we are going to be continuing with our Purity Culture um, mini-series. So if you haven't already um, listened to our two episodes in that we did in November, I would very much encourage you to go back and listen to them. Um, the first episode in November is with Andrew and I, where we're kind of breaking down what is purity culture? What are some of the, the harms of purity culture? What are clients bringing into our offices as we are trauma coaching, therapists, things like that, um, as well as some resources. And then the second episode in November is with um, one of the most wonderful uh, people. Her name is Erica Smith, and she is a sex educator and does a lot of work with people coming out of purity culture, specifically in the areas of comprehensive sex ed and just really learning how to reclaim your sexual self. So Erica joined us for an amazing conversation. We talked about everything from comprehensive sex ed to some of the things that she works with people uh, in her programs, the things that she sees, the reclamation stories. We got into talking about uh, pornography and if porn addiction is actually a thing. So again, if you have um, have some time, go back and listen to those episodes. And uh, I think that'll just kind of naturally lead into our episode today. So this month, we are going to be talking about the experience of growing up and being socialized male in purity culture. We are going to be joined by a professional as well as somebody who has gone through it on a lived experience. Today will be our professional um, episode where we will be welcoming in a friend and colleague of mine, Brad Onishi. I'll tell you a little bit more about him in just a few moments. Brad has done some amazing work um, in both one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, group coaching, as well as some incredible um, uh, information that he has shared on social media about the experience of growing up male in purity culture and some of the long-term effects of that. This is oftentimes a topic that isn't talked about as much So, um, as the focus is, and maybe even rightfully is, mostly on females and women, uh, individuals growing up uh, being socialized female in purity culture. So I'm excited to be able to expand that conversation today. 
And as usual, we know that sometimes the things that we talk about are a little bit intense or maybe even triggering. And so the invitation is always to take care of yourself first. Please feel free to skip this podcast or portions of it and come back only if and when you are ready. We trust you to know yourself and what you need. But before we get into the episode today, let's go ahead and have a vocabulary lesson. Okay, y'all, today's vocabulary lesson is a good one. We're going to be talking about a term that I hear about on social media all the time, and I hear this a lot in post-religious, ex-evangelical, ex-fundamentalist spaces, and that is the term of parentification or parentified child. So let's just start off the bat. I went on, you know, you can do a quick Google search to find out what is a parentified child or what is parentification. Um, So we're going to talk about that as well as what, how that pertains to high control religion. But if you were to look this up online, um, parentification occurs when a child is regularly expected to provide emotional or practical support for a parent instead of receiving that support themselves. This is oftentimes a role reversal um, and can disrupt the natural process of maturing, which can cause long-term negative effects on a child's physical and mental health. Okay, so that actually is, I could just like close this section up here, but I think it's important that we break this down just a little bit so we can further understand parentification, um, maybe give it a little bit more of a robust context, as well as maybe help you organize your own experiences or the experiences of other people around you. So um, the first thing I think that is important to know is that this is not a diagnosis. So parentification, not a diagnosis that you can receive, but it is just a psychological term that we use to help us describe things. These, there's various terms and concepts that come out of different uh, personality theories, different modalities of therapy, different research. Parentified or parenti- per, excuse me, parentification is one of the psychological terms. Um, so. I think by the definition, it's probably pretty easy to see how children may be parentified within religion, but I think it's important to have this discussion. So parentification occurs when a child is regularly expected to provide emotional or practical support for a parent instead of receiving that support themselves. So we know that as children, there are certain needs that we have. They're just fundamental needs. It is, yes, the things like food, water, shelter. Those are basic fundamental needs. But as children, we also need things like safety, support, security. And those are things that we get from our parents. So that is being able to trust that your parent is the bigger, wiser, stronger adult that can pick you up when you make mistakes, that will be there for you to calm you down, to support you, to um, go through life with you, to help you make difficult decisions. Um, They are there to provide a sense of safety so that when the world is in flux or things are confusing or don't make sense, your parents are can come, you can come to your parents and feel a sense of safety or support within them. Ideally, when a parent is able to offer this to a child, then the child can learn how to do that for themselves and ultimately do that with other people in the world. And that's where we might get some of those terms like safe relationships. Um, When we have that model to us, when we can embody that, we can then also do that with other people. But in a parentified relationship, the script kind of flips and we see that the child then is often the one who is in charge of providing that type of support to their parents. Now, before you're like, oh, no, my parents never were like my, the go-to, like they didn't come gossip. They didn't tell me, you know, all their secrets or, you know, whatever. That's, that's maybe an extreme or no, I wouldn't say extreme. That's an overt form of parentification. However, that's not the only thing. So when we have, um, children who learn that it is my job to make sure that my mom or dad is not mad at me. Um, You know, if I do something that makes my parent upset, that's not a good thing. So I have to learn how to adapt and navigate on a regular basis around my parents' mood so that I am 
you know, kind of existing in such a way that is providing them a sense of emotional stability and support rather than them being able to provide that for me. So that might mean um, as a child, maybe I am not allowed to have emotional expressions. Or if I do have an emotional expression, then my parent kind of matches that emotional expression. And then I have to be the one to make sure that my parent is okay versus my parent being able to be that bigger, stronger person and help me feel okay. This is certainly not to say that parents can't be human or that they aren't allowed to have emotions or make mistakes. Certainly they are. In fact, research tells us that, you know, parents need to do the quote unquote right thing or do it the right way 30% of the time. The other 70% of the time, they need to be able to repair well. Now that doesn't give us excuses for poor or abusive behavior. It just says that parents are allowed to be imperfect and they still get to can be good parents within this. So what we're looking then with parentification is that there maybe is a lack of acknowledgement that this is happening or there are unspoken or spoken expectations of what a child might do and the role is never reversed where the parent is not being able to come back and be that support for the child. In some cases, especially families that have a lot of children, we see parentification coming out in maybe the older siblings being in charge of the younger siblings or even doing tasks that are like far uh, beyond their um, chronological or developmental age. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pick on the Duggars here for a moment, only because we saw this on TV. So this is public knowledge, public record, right? There was, um, what, like 19 children and they were very overt in saying the older children have their younger children buddies that they are responsible for essentially raising them. Of course, the parents were always the parents, but the older Duggar children, especially the girls had a responsibility with the younger children for making sure they're physical needs were provided for, their, uh, getting their food, getting them dressed, being the emotional support. And that would be also parentified because they are doing for the children what the parents should have been doing, not only for those children, but for them. So that's where we might also might see uh, a, a kind of another form of parentification. So of course, we see this a lot in religion. The other thing that we see within religion is this idea of honor your father and mother. And And a lot of parents will use that as a blanket statement to either um, rationalize their own behavior and emotions and outbursts and things like that. And or they will use it as as a way to explain that a child's job is to make sure that their parents are, are okay, even if it is at the expense of themselves. Now, I want to bring in one other term here, and that is infantilization. And we often hear that in social media spaces, and we've heard it a lot in post-religious spaces as well. So infantilization is going to be um, this idea where we treat a person, whether that is a child or even an adult, at as a much younger chronological and developmental age than they actually are. We see this a lot of times in um in high control religion. Women or individuals socialized female are often infantilized, uh, being told that they need to cover up parts of themselves, make themselves more childlike, make themselves meek and submissive. Um, like not having a voice or learning to speak in a very high, soft voice. Um, we'll go back to Michelle Duggar there, right? Go listen to Michelle Duggar's voice, where they're kind of trying to make that individual seem a lot younger and also kind of have this um psychological standpoint that they are helpless without you, without uh, somebody to come and do things for them. Now, on an overarching scale, this can be seen as the need for a savior. Infantilization can be that there. I am nothing. I would not know how to exist if it were not for you, whoever that higher power is. That actually could be a form of infantilization. I need somebody else to essentially organize my life for me, do my life for me, or I will be unable to to do that. 
So that would be a form of infantilization. So the question then becomes, is it possible to be a parentified and infantilized? Because maybe there's some of you going, well, I actually feel like I'm both. And the answer to that is Yes, absolutely. And sometimes that's why it can feel so crazy making because on the one hand, we're being told that we don't know what's best for us. We're being told that we need to depend on our parents to tell us what is right and wrong and everything else. And on the other hand, we are also then maybe responsible for keeping our younger siblings alive, or we are responsible to make sure that our parents are okay. So it can feel very confusing. Um, So I just want to call that out as something that can happen in tandem with one another. So in terms then of like, what are some things that we can do to kind of heal that parentified child? I think sometimes it's good to start to just let yourself sit with the knowledge of perhaps this is something that fits my experience. There can be a huge um, relief I would say in what's called psychoeducation. So educating yourself on kind of the psychological terms and aspects of what this is, just to kind of get a familiarity so you can start to see what resonates with you. I also think that doing inner child work can be really helpful, giving yourself experiences, um, kind of redo experiences that maybe you should have been able to do back then, um, but but weren't able to. And that could be things like play and pleasure and relationships and connection. Oftentimes, there is a lot of really like basic skills that need to be learned that can sometimes feel humiliating or shameful, like, gosh, I'm this many years old and I don't know how to do this. Um, what I might invite you into more is compassion, that it would make sense that you don't know how to do certain things if you never had anybody teaching you those things. And that doesn't mean those things aren't important, but it does mean that you need to learn them. So sometimes that's part of that healing process uh, is setting up doctor's appointments and um, learning how to eat uh, nutritional foods or learning how to do some uh, basic tasks like hygiene related tasks, showering, brushing your teeth, washing your face, taking care of different aspects in, of your body and body parts. Um, that can oftentimes look like uh, maybe learning some basics of finances, whether that's budgeting or saving or retirement or things like that that many of us missed out on a lot of that because we were infantilized and or parentified, where some of those things were just simply not taught to us because that wasn't deemed as important as either taking care of our parents, making sure they were okay, or taking care of younger siblings, or being told that we're childlike, these things don't really matter because Jesus is coming back. Um, And so I think that giving ourselves that permission to slowly lean into the the various things and practices that we can be doing in order to... um, to kind of give ourselves some new experiences can be really, really help ha- uh, helpful. I'm going to go back to, as I close out, that word of self-compassion. I think giving yourself many, many opportunities to kind of bathe or wear self-compassion, bathe in self-compassion, let yourself feel that. Like it can feel very difficult to go, hey, I'm 35 years old and I'm just learning this or that thing, or I should have learned this thing when I was 20 and here I am at 40 or 50 or 60. And um, it can be really easy to slide into shame. But what I might invite you to instead was compassion and to say, well, yeah, you're, you're right. I should, I should have. That was something that was not afforded to me. I should have been able to have access to that and I did not. But instead of getting caught in that, I am going to lean into my own sense of worth and empowerment and go after that thing, give that thing to myself and keep moving forward. All right, everyone. After our little detour for the holidays, we're finally back on this topic of purity culture. And like I said at the beginning of the episode, if you haven't already listened to the episodes that we dropped in November, I would highly encourage you to do so. You know, when we talk about purity culture, most people acknowledge that women or individuals socialized as female in that system bore the brunt of the purity culture teachings. And that is true. Next month, we are going to be joined by a couple of women to discuss the professional and lived experience sides of growing up female in purity culture. This month, however, we are going to start with a group of people who don't always get as much attention in the conversation about purity culture, and that is men. 
<laughs> or males or individuals socialized male growing up in purity culture. And for the sake of this conversation, we'll just use the overarching term men. So most of the dialogue around men and purity culture is that they were taught that they were these out of control sexual beasts. They're expected to act in these very specific ways sexually when they're married. And they are people who will constantly try to bulldoze through the boundaries that their sisters in Christ are trying to maintain in order to keep them pure. These were, you know, most certainly things that men grew up being taught. But I actually believe that the conversation goes far beyond that. See, I grew up with male siblings, so I got a front row seat to the experience of growing up male in purity culture. And though I do believe that women experience a heavier burden as it pertains to the impact of purity culture, kind of generally speaking, when I was in the thick of it, I really believed that men were the ones who bore the brunt of the struggle. I would hear my brothers lament at how difficult it was to keep themselves pure and that if girls only understood what it was like for us guys, they would change the way they dressed. Oh my gosh, I could not tell you how many times I was a part of those conversations. You know, since I believed my highest calling in life was to be a wife and a mother, that meant that one day I could have sons that struggled like this or daughters who had the power to make the boys struggles. So I prioritized doing my part and making sure that the men around me wouldn't see me as an object of lust. And I was very determined to help the young women in the youth group that I ran do the same. Throughout my time as a therapist and a coach, I have been able to work with many individuals who grew up socialized male in purity culture and hear about their unique struggles. Many of them have felt a complex set of emotions. They do recognize that women bore the brunt of the rules and regulations, and they want to center women's stories and healing while also recognizing that they too did not escape the negative impacts. Many of them have experienced tremendous amounts of shame for not matching the ideal of what they were taught a godly man is, you know, which is mostly uh, resembling, you know, a combination of William Wallace, Braveheart, and John Wayne. In hushed tones, many of my male clients have wondered if they have something wrong with them because their libido doesn't seem to be as high as other people's or because they want to dress in a way that might be considered more feminine or they feel an immense amount of pressure to financially provide for their family because they believe that this is what a godly man is supposed to do. I've had conversations with men who have struggled uh, with repressed sexuality, experience sexual dysfunction, or feel extreme guilt because their body believes that they did something wrong when they had consensual sex, as if they had now given in to their animalistic urges, and it truly means that they are a sexual monster. Many of the men I talk with are afraid of themselves and carry deep wounds of introjected messages about what a rotten and disgusting person they are just because they were born male. I'm not big into the whole quote unquote, who had it worse game. In purity culture, everybody loses. We all suffer the impact of it, great and small, and many of us have a long journey of healing from purity culture. Today's guest is Brad Onishi, who is a professor, podcast host of Straight White American Jesus, author of Preparing for War, and a friend and colleague. Uh, while Brad's public-facing work most often centers around, around white Christian nationalism, the marriage of religion and politics, and current political events and the impact of what they have on our present lives, Brad is also someone who has spoken out about the long-term harm and impact of purity culture on men. So Brad brings to us his lived experience of growing up male in purity culture, getting married young and quote unquote, doing it the right way, only to get divorced at a young age and had to learn new ways of navigating relationships and his own ideas of masculinity that had been deeply influenced by evangelicalism and purity culture. But he also brings to us his professional perspective from his research on the topic, as well as his client-facing work as a former coach at the Center for Trauma Resolution and Recovery, where his focus was on supporting men who are feeling the impact of and healing from purity culture in individual and group coaching. I am so excited to have Brad on the podcast today, so let's welcome him in. Welcome, Brad, to the Sunday School Dropouts mm -hmm. podcast. It's so wonderful to be with you today. 
No, it's awesome to be here. And I am a Sunday school dropout. So I feel like I'm, I, I feel like I fit in, you know? <laughs> so it is good that the Lord has brought us together. <laughs> Okay. It's been good. Thank you for having me. I will see you next time. Thank you. Awesome. So on that note, uh, we're going to talk about all things men and purity culture today, which um, earlier in the introduction, I said this is probably one of the lesser talked about things within purity culture recovery. Um, So why don't we, if it feels okay for you, just start out with a brief kind of background of your own experience in purity culture and maybe kind of the recovery pieces of that. And then we'll get into the rest of it. Sure. I uh, converted at 14. And so I think my story is a little uh, anomalous uh, compared to some because I converted right at the moment when I had hit puberty and I was already doing the sort of junior high, you know, kissing behind um, the ball field, like Ooh. stuff. Right. So like <laughs> I'm 14 and yeah, I enter the church. From. <laughs> no, no, there was. And and it made yeah. for a good testimony. Like it was a really good testimony uh, piece. But, um, you know, when I converted at 14, I had um, done things that were not allowed in purity culture. I, I and, and were, you know, um, sort of wrestling with, I mean, I remember thinking when I converted, like, I walked around my school yard one day at lunch and was just like, can I really commit to, mm. okay, yeah, no sex before marriage, but like all, like everything in between mm-hmm. is, it, can I do this? And I, I mean, it really, that was the sort of thing that was the last check mark before I said, yes, I'm going to give my life entirely to Jesus um, in May of my eighth grade year. So um, I entered, I entered the youth group end of eighth grade and I was a youth group superstar. I was the convert who, was all in. I, uh, if the church was open, I was there. If there was a youth group night, if there was Sunday school, if there was a beach day, if there was summer camp, a missions trip, I'm in, I want to be there and I want to be, uh, learning, worshiping, helping the whole thing. Um, that included purity culture. And so I, uh, committed to everything you're supposed to commit to in purity culture. Um, no sex and no kissing before marriage. That was my goal. No kissing. Mm -hmm. My most of high school, um, if you would have asked me about like romantic stuff, I would have said, well, it's probably better to like focus on the Lord. Uh, However, I did meet. I know. Uh, (laughs) I mean, I said the same thing. I'm just so nice to hear a boy say that, too. (laughs) That's, you know, that's the kind of but I did. I did meet somebody who shared was also a convert and was shared my like we were equally yoked and shared my like absolute zeal and zealotry for, uh, for our conversion. And so we started dating and we didn't kiss for four years. Wow. And uh, I was in an accountability group, uh, every Monday, uh, junior, senior year, I would go after school and hang with like four or five guys. And we would confess, um, that we had, Mm -hmm. you know, done things that, uh, were not purity culture, um, uh, allowed. And that didn't mean like we, you know, like were involved any another human. It was like, Hey, I, yes. I, there's a girl in my English class and she's really cute. And I looked at her twice and thought about her being cute. And, uh, I just need to confess that. Or, yeah. um, I got the new, uh, for me, it was always like, I got this new surfing magazine that I uh, subscribed to. And there's like people in bikinis and I might've looked at the page for five seconds yes. longer than I should have. I mean, that's what we would do in our accountability group. Um, definitely committed to true love weights. Definitely um, said, uh, you know, that's that's part of, I wore a ring. I had the ring. People asked me about it. And then final thing I'll say is um, I was so committed to this and so invested that I remember telling a friend that I wish I was blind. I wish I couldn't see. Because uh, I I thought if I was blind, I wouldn't be tempted to lust after people. And then my walk with God would be better. So that was sort of my mindset as a 16-year-old is I wish I couldn't see because then I would be closer to God. That just, it breaks my heart. I have all male siblings. And so I obviously growing up, woman, a woman had that experience, but then had this front row seat to my brother's. And I just, I mean, I remember them agonizing. I don't know that they said that, but I'm sure they thought that. And just hearing them say all those things, like, if girls only knew, like, 
what it what it did to us and all these things. And I really took that to heart. And I was like, I will do my part then. I will make sure that all the things I'm wearing and the way I walk and how I sit and what I talk about is like to make sure that you, brother or brother in Christ, are okay. Um, because yeah, I, I I don't think you're alone in saying, you know, I wish I was blind. That yeah. is just it's heartbreaking though to think that. A 16 year old would say it would actually better be better so that this temptation isn't there. Yeah. So I uh, ended up marrying the, the girl I dated in high school. We got married the like two days after my second uh, year at college. Okay. So by that time, I was 20 and I was married and I was in charge of a youth group at a mega church. I was a full time pastor and a full-time student. So really balanced <laughs> life yes. for a 20-year-old, very yes. uh, healthy and mm-hmm. uh, not overextended or stressed at all. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. I love that you could share your wisdom uh, of a 20-year-old with an 18-year-old. So that's a lot of experience. <laughs> now, the big question is, did you wait to kiss until your wedding day? You know what? We didn't. So we, um, we had the situation where we'd been dating like three years mm-hmm. and we, we just kept doing the like longer and longer hug at night after ice cream, or mm-hmm. we're going to sit in the car and say goodbye after a movie. And our necks are like rubbing like, and, and we just had this really honest talk of like, what are we doing? We're going to end up kissing. So we should just do it. So like we did it, we planned it. We prayed beforehand. We prayed afterward. It was a whole thing. And, uh, yeah, there's more to the story that I will tell you uh, and later, you later but I'm not going <laughs> to tell right now. Just, we'll fair, just leave it there. Fair yeah. enough. Can't wait till we're done recording. Give me a Diet uh, Coke <laughs> and some kombucha and you have no idea what you're going to hear about. I got half of, of it here. Okay. So, All right. yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I will look forward to that. But, um, so what kind of, you know, I, I I mean, I know bits and pieces of your story. I know you ended up kind of um, leaving the job or as a pastor traveling and you guys were divorced Mm -hmm. um, amicably from everything you've said. How did you like, what was it like after that in terms of learning how to exist outside of purity culture as you related to other people, you know, you know, as like a 20 something year old guy? Yeah. So I moved to England for graduate school when I was uh, 24 and uh, my then wife came with me. We decided to divorce like very quickly after that. So she Mm -hmm. went back to the States. I stayed in England and all of a sudden I'm single and I'm Mm -hmm. not only single, but I'm an adult uh, for the first time where I don't live in my hometown and I'm not in ministry. So before that, if I left the house, I would uh, see 10 people I knew at the grocery store, at the ball field, at the wherever. Uh, now I'm no one. I'm 6,000 miles away. I'm not married and I'm not a minister. And it's like, what now? And part of that was like, okay, let's go on a date. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> how do you do that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is like, so weird. So I, I'll just share this story real quick. I, I went on a date with somebody I met. I was so nervous mm-hmm. and um I I didn't know like what to do. I didn't know how to I didn't know how to say yeah, it's really fun. This is a nice beer we're having. Oh, how's your wine? Great. Yeah, I was um I got married uh to someone I met when I was 14. Um we stayed married uh till just like I don't know. Uh 10 weeks ago. And I've never been on a date since I was uh, in junior high school, where my mom took me to the movie theater with uh, someone named Tori. So anyway, I'm having a great time. I hope you are too. Uh, It's a lovely pub we're in, uh, decent food. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, it is going to rain. I'm glad I brought the umbrella. So, you know, it was just like, how do you do that with Mm -hmm. someone who has no knowledge and no experience in this subculture that has just like, you know saturated your life. So that was the beginning. There's way more to the story, but that was kind of a first step. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know today we're going to focus a little bit more on kind of like the professional side of things. Some of the things we see coming out of purity culture for men, long-term impacts. Um, You've done work with 
men at uh, the Center for Trauma Resolution and Recovery. You've done research and everything like that. So what was it that got you interested kind of in this topic generally, you know, whether it was the research piece or working with men generally who have come out of purity culture? What really motivated me to to start that kind of work was, um, and I've said this before, that there's just so much amazing work on purity culture that uh, is about women's experience and girls' experience. And there should be. There should be, there should be, there should be. Uh, purity culture is asymmetrical, it is patriarchal, and it it affects girls and women in ways that are uh, different than than boys and men, and also just, I think, much worse. There's no getting away from that. There's no arguing. This is not a situation where I'm like, what about the men, right? It has, there's none of that. But I also noticed for me that like, as I started looking for books and for stuff that would help me as a man recover from purity culture, I didn't find much. And I thought, hey, if I don't heal, I'm going to keep sort of insane, the same patterns that I learned. My relationships are going to follow the same patterns. The unhelpful, the harmful things that marked my self-relationship, my relationship with others is going to continue. So if men don't heal, they will not uh, get to a place where they will be good partners, where they will be good parents, where they will be good friends, where they'll have healthy relationships mm-hmm. with men, women, or anyone. Um, it doesn't. So for me, that was the motivation. And I think that one of the biggest things that I learned is that purity culture teaches men to hate themselves twice. Um, you know, you you really get to the point where you wish you were blind. You hate yourself because you're a carnal, fleshly animal that can't resist temptation. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. But what purity culture does is say, when you get married, you don't transform from that carnal, fleshly animal into some saintly being, you just take that carnality and that animality and you just put it into the marriage context. Mm -hmm. So you now should in some way inhabit that animality and Mm -hmm. inhabit that fleshiness to the full. So Mm -hmm. hate yourself for not being able to resist temptation when you're 16. When you get married, you better be Mm -hmm. that like craven, insatiable animal. Otherwise, you're not a real man. And if you're not that, then you should probably be ashamed of yourself again, right? So that was my experience in terms of just the the feeling like I failed all the time mm-hmm. uh, as a non-married person and then feeling as a married person, there was this ideal set up for masculinity and sexuality that was unfulfillable. It was like the it was like something that wasn't realistic and yet something that myself and my wife both expected. And so, that was just really, really a lot to work through, much less all the other aspects of the gender nature of purity culture, the, the the gender roles, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay. There's so many things in that statement right there that I'm like, okay, we need to, we need to talk about that. Let's start with um, we'll I want to talk eventually about some of the things that showed up in some of your clients, my clients, things like that. But this message of this insatiable, animalistic out of control sex drive, uh, men just cannot help themselves, right? This idea. How do you think that actually impacts men? So I think what it does is it creates um, an idea of what your sex drive should be as it's created by God. Okay. So God created men to be this. They are leaders. They are the church. They are the, the, the family. They are the, the, the civil and city leaders and countries leaders. But they're, as you just said, insatiable. They're ravenous. That's how he made you, man. So you just have to funnel it in the right way. So if you're in purity culture, you're thinking, okay, once I get married and I'm 20, 25, 30, however old I am, unless I want to have sex five times a day or 19 times a day, I'm not a real man in my wife's eyes or God's eyes. Um, I'm not somebody who's fulfilling my role uh, in my in my relationship. And so I better live up to that. Now you're like, okay, so that's sexuality. But then what accompanies that is a sense of masculinity, right? A sense of gender is like, well, a real man is active. He is always pursuing sex, but he's also initiating everything else. He's aggressive. He doesn't ask questions. He just acts. He doesn't wait. He just takes. And so if you're a real man, you're going to be that. And so who are the men that we end up looking up to in youth group, in church? They're these guys who are rough. 
and gruff. They don't listen. They don't think that empathy is a virtue. They don't think that conversation with their partner and negotiation and compromise are good things. They are always just sort of acting uh, in ways that are uh, focused on what they want. And you start to think, okay, if I want to be a real Christian man, if I want to be masculine in the way God made me, I better be like that, right? Mm, If I'm a poet or a violinist, or if I'm somebody who likes to sit back and draw pictures or create music, or I don't, there's so many ways that you might think, yeah, I don't like to play football and I don't like to grunt and I don't, (laughs) uh, I am married and I don't want to have sex eight times a day. That that's just not what I want. That's not how my body works you start to feel like you're just not really what you're supposed to be. And there's a deep sense of shame that, that will plague you. Yeah. I can, the shame piece, that's definitely something that has come up with my clients as well. It's interesting. I I guess I haven't really thought of that. um, Just like the context of what men learn, how that impacts them. And I'm just thinking like, there was so much of that, that I held even after being in purity culture and the expectations I had for the men that I was dating and in relationships with and um, felt, then I felt shame when they didn't perform in that standard. It meant something was wrong with me when in realistically speaking, like they weren't, <laughs> you know, like, I, you know, I come to find out the one person that did want to have sex, you know, like eight times a day, that was more abnormal than, you know, normal. Yeah. yeah. Um, Yeah. And so I can, it it really then spans it and then it can create this real sense of like resentment, confusion in the relationship um, and not having a lot of tools to dialogue about how to, how to explain my experience or your experience of that. Yeah. And I feel like what happened for me is even when I left the church and left purity culture, I took that image of sexuality and masculinity with me. So Mm -hmm. then it was like, all right, I'm not married. I didn't even have a, like a teenage adolescent fun time. Like most, Mm -hmm. a lot of us didn't. So I'm going to go out now and just have fun. Let's meet people. Let's hook up. Let's do it. Right. And I just thought, unless I do that, Mm -hmm. I'm not doing what you're supposed to. (laughs) So like, you're supposed to just hook up randomly all the time. Right. And it took me years to discover like, yeah, that's kind of fun. And I'm probably just never going to be good at that or want that. Cause like, I'm just this person who's way too sensitive, way too into connection. My life is about like relationships that are meaningful. And that's not me saying, judging anyone who can do that. It just, it was just about self-discovery and saying, I'm really bad at this. I'm really bad at the, like, I met you on an app or I met you at a bar and we're going to just like hang out for a night or two. Um, But in my head, I still needed to be what purity culture, you you see what I'm saying? Even when you leave purity culture, you're still trying to live up to the image of it, even though you're railing against it. Yeah. And that's like such a mind trick that you have to get over of like, maybe me living out this like room springer, like second adolescence Mm -hmm. is not me doing actually what I want, but it's just me saying, I'm, I'm going to live up to purity culture by railing against it in every way, but it still has its grip on me. Yeah. I oftentimes say that like, you know, we, when we get out of like a high control religion and I would put purity culture in that as well, like our tendency is to swing to the other side of the spectrum, right? But neither one of those sides is necessarily centering the self, capital S self, right? Because in one side, you are prescribed the set of rules and the other side, you're just doing the opposite of the prescribed rules. So there's no room to actually show up or figure out who I am with that. And I think so many people coming out of high control religions just move into that opposite side and can do a lot of harm to themselves, their bodies, relationships, and, and emotionally, psychologically even. Um, And that's really hard. That's really hard to navigate it. And especially when you find out, wow, I'm not, I'm not how, how they taught me that I was. Yes. That's exactly it. I'm not how they taught me how I was. I'm not who they said I was. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so what does that mean? Am I, am I not, you know, am I masculine? Am I not masculine? Am I, am I, am I living up to who I'm supposed to be or not? What, what does masculine even mean now? I don't know. I don't have any other models of that. I don't even know what that means to be a man who's not this. So yeah, everything you just said that, that was my experience. Yeah. So within that, like, okay, we'll come, we'll hit masculinity in a second, but 
As you think back to like your client facing work or even the research that you've done, what what do you see as some of the common things like men who grew up in purity culture that they're dealing with like psychologically or physiologically? Um, yeah, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, and I think some of these will be things that are are also things that um, you know those who identify as women or socialize as women will say um, I, they're they're probably have different significations and meanings, but I do think some of the language. So a lot of men will say, yeah, I just, I just tried to divorce myself from my body hmm. because, um, you know, for two reasons, I'll give you two reasons. One is women are taught that their bodies and girls are taught that their bodies are hyper visible in purity culture, right? Don't, don't you, you said all of it and it, it's so hard to listen to. Don't sit a certain way. Don't walk a certain way. Don't wear this. Don't wear that because you are hyper visible. You are a stumbling block. Mm-hmm. You know, as a, as a boy and a man in purity culture, I just thought of myself as having no body. Like, mm-hmm. So like if I'm at the pool party and I I don't think to myself, well, I better like be careful about taking my shirt off because uh, boys can be a stumbling. Like I just, it never occurred to me that like a boy or a man's body was actually existent as a thing in the world that would create desire because yeah. it was just like we were taught that women and girls only liked sex be- when it was in the context of love. And it really was only for intimacy, not for pleasure. Yeah. Obligatory. If yeah. like you're at the church uh, swim party and the like high school quarterback takes his shirt off and he has an eight pack and he looks great and he's tanned. It never occurred to me that like you have a body and there's probably people here who desire that body and are like, right. So when I got out of all that, I had no relationship with my body. I didn't have any sense of like regulating it, a self image, a self conception, um, who I am, how I want to present in the world, um, what that means. And then two, I just didn't want to, um, I didn't want to have a body because my body was the thing that made me evil. And so, and I think that every, and all the clients I talked to, all the men I've, you know, discussed this with are like, Jesus came into my heart and then he went up to my brain and he stayed in my brain. And I was just a mind in a vat. And I was just doing everything I could to discipline that brain to like get away from the body and all of its reactions. And so you have to learn to live in your body for the first time. And you also have to learn to not hate your body for the first time. And those two are linked, but I, but mm-hmm. they're a little bit different too. Yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of men I work with, the first thing that we do is I have a body, which right sounds so simple uh, or obvious rather. And yet I think what you're describing is exactly explaining why it is that that's actually our starting point is, oh, I actually have a body Um, before we can move into anything else. Yeah, that is so interesting. So even, uh, so we've got kind of these embodiment pieces, you've talked about shame, you know, I want to kind of leave room for like purity culture being more than just the sex piece of it. Of course, there is all these other like uh, gender roles. I I think about like the pressure to be the head of the household and how that comes out like financially and responsibility wise. I wonder if we can just talk about that for a little bit, just in terms of what that is and how that impacts men then like on a living basis. I think there's this sense of just overwhelming pressure now, you know, and again, we could, and I know you, you have, and so many others have talked about how this is so unfair. And so um, just, it feels like erasure for, for women uh, in mm. these kinds of households. I think for me, what it felt like was like, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't, yeah. I don't want to make all the decisions. I don't want to just have unilateral control over the money and what we're doing with it. And what we're going to do tomorrow. And just, I don't like dictating to people that it's just, I I don't have any bones in my body that are good at that. And that actually want to do that. It doesn't feel good. It's not my natural like inclination. So all this pressure to do that feels bad. And then I'll add one bit for me. And I think this plays into what I've talked to many men about is there's an ability disability piece here. Right. And so I'm neurodivergent. I'm I'm dyspraxic. Dyspraxia is not something a ton of people are familiar with. But what it means is is that, um, in in a very practical terms, is I am really, 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 really unable to do a lot of mundane tasks in ways other people can. My body does not process. My brain and my body don't work together to process it that way. I couldn't tie a tie until I was thirty. 
if you said right now, Laura, if Laura was like, hey, do you want to translate this chapter of Emile Zola's novel from French to English or go hang this picture? Which one do you choose? You get, you just have to do one and then you're done for the day. I would translate to French any, rather than go hang the picture. So here's the point. When you tell me or you tell someone else who has like any sort of thing related to like this kind of sense of their, their body and their ability, you're like, you're the head of the household. You're not a real man unless you fix the flat tire. Unless you pack the bag, unless you build the house, unless you, um, you know, do all of that quote unquote man stuff, mm. then you're just a failure. I felt like a failure every second of every day. Like uh, I had other men in the church criticizing me because I didn't pack the car right for the, the, the youth group trip. I had other men sort of belittle me because I couldn't back the boat up on the, at the lake because we were on a youth group trip. Right. Um, you know, my, my ex-wife isn't like, we're still friends. She's like this amazing, wondrous human being who, um, is like really good at that stuff. And so there was always these moments of like, she would do a lot of it, but we didn't want other people to see because at yes. church they would like make fun of us or look at us weird or look at her as like, you're the woman, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing with the tools in your hand? Why do you have a saw? You're a woman. And then they would look at me like, why did you let her have a saw? And it just felt awful. All of that felt terrible. So I don't know. I hope that answers your question, but yeah. Yeah, it does. I mean, I think there, you know, I've, what's been interesting to me, this is more on a personal kind of note is I've, I've dated several men who have come out of purity culture, done some great work on like, oh, here's the impact and, and all of these things, but they realize, okay, here's this thing I didn't like. I didn't like having to be the, where the buck stopped. And I didn't have, you know, I didn't like these things and I believe them. They did not. And that wasn't maybe even where their forte was, but they don't, they haven't yet realized how that's embodied and how then in these other relationships, um, that's a very hard thing to learn to give up. And there can be that awkwardness and like clunkiness of, um, you know, yeah, this, this gal can figure it out for themselves or, um, my opinion doesn't matter in this decision, you know, things like that. And it is, that is not to knock on any specific person or gender or anything like that. But I think those embodied messages, um, I, they don't die easily and they don't, yeah. they don't die from simply saying, Oh, that's not what I believe anymore. And to me, it feels very important to recognize like how embodied the messages of purity culture become even beyond um, a sex and sexuality and, and looking for where that shows up that continues to show up in relationship to other people or just in life in general. I have like young kids now and there's always these moments when you like, you know, there, there's so many things I don't want to do because I'm like exhausted and I don't want to go um, do. And I, one of the exercises I do all the time with myself is like, okay, are you, do you not want to do that? Are you going to let your partner do that because uh, of this reason or because you're a man and you still 15 years later are holding in your mind and body, the idea that that's her job or that you just don't want to do it. So you're not going to do it. And so, there, and I'm always like trying to think, okay, is this just a, I'm tired and I did that. So can you do this? Or is this a, you know, the vestiges of purity culture in my body as you're explaining? I can really appreciate that because I think the other point I know I didn't, I didn't pre prepare you for this is there are so many messages in purity culture that are directly echoed in our culture yes. at large that have nothing to do with purity culture, but it is about patriarchy and oppression and capitalism and all these things. You know, I, I we're recording around Thanksgiving time and I'm thinking back to last year, I was going on a trip with my partner at the time and he showed up at my house with his two duffel bags or whatever. And that was it. Like, didn't think Hey, we're we're doing a whole Thanksgiving dinner. We need pots and pans and knives and couldn't figure out why I was frustrated at midnight and we had seven tubs of things to bring, you know, and he just and I was like, "Oh, he is this is a this is not because he is trying to shirk responsibilities. It is not because he is a cruel person who expects all me all, and only me to do this. Um this is simply a result of like 
where purity culture and culture at large intersect and um, we can become just kind of falling into those roles. Um, So I can appreciate the um, attention you are paying to like, why is it that I don't want to do this thing, you know, and Um, and yet I think those are messages, you know, in the few couples that I do work with, that's something that continuously comes up in their relationships is how do we, um, craft our relationship in a way that doesn't automatically fall into purity culture and, or a culture at large roles. You know, and for me, it's just, it's, you know, an an easy question I ask myself is, all right, what is the labor that I'm not even considering like, okay, what's my partner doing? Did I even consider that that was like labor we needed to do in the house today or, or this evening or to get ready for this thing? Um, I think this comes up around holidays. I think this comes up around vacation. I think it comes up around trips. I think it comes up around family dynamics. Like, you know, are they feeling this pressure to perform a certain thing or to do certain tasks that I haven't even considered? That is, that is the kind of thing that leads to like, you know, a disproportionate labor distribution in the house and a sense of like, oh, I just don't have to do that because I'm the man. And that's patriarchy slash purity culture all all intertwined. So I'm curious to know, putting you on the spot, and we'll we'll direct it towards the clients you've worked with. How do you work with men where that is, um, where they are trying to own that and trying to look for those ways that I can step up to the plate and do Mm -hmm. the emotional labor as well as physical. Uh, Yeah. I'm just really curious to know. So I think there's, I think one good shorthand is this, what are the, what are the situations where my mouth should do less? And what are the situations where my hands should do more? Mm. Because with men, we're taught to always speak up whenever we, anything happens, time passes, we're we're supposed to have a comment on it. That's what you think is uh, you do as a man. So what are the moments you're like, nope, don't need to talk here. Don't need, it's not my place. I don't get to interject. I don't have an uh, an authority. I don't have the right. I don't have something like, um, so when can you do less with your mouth or voice? When can you do more with your hands? Meaning, yep. I have never considered that that has to get done and I need to like take inventory. But I think a lot of this goes back to what you said earlier is if you begin with, I have a body Mm -hmm. and you start taking inventory of what you do with your body and how you direct it, then you start to get in touch with, oh, all right, I have a free moment. Should I fold the laundry? Should I vacuum? Should I get ready for that trip? I, everyone's household is different. Everybody has things in their house and they work a certain way. There's a certain economy. So I don't know what happens with everyone else. Um, you know, do I not want to change that diaper just because I don't feel like it? Yeah. Well, okay. I don't, that's a man thought probably. Mm-hmm. That's probably a man <laughs> thought. I just don't, well, the, 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 the diaper's dirty. So someone's got to do it. Mm-hmm. Why not you just because you're the man. Okay. Purity culture, buddy. That's patriarchy. So I just think you start with, I have a body. And then the shorthand is, where am I going to speak less? That's a challenge and an exercise. And then where am I going to like lift or help or aid more? And behind the scenes, oftentimes without speaking, that's to me like a really easy shortcut. I I really appreciate that because I think that's practical and uh, not to stereotype, but I think men appreciate practicality. Just tell me what to do, right? You know, okay, speak less, do more. Love it. You know, (laughs) t-shirt. And there's also, and there's also one more, which is, which is, okay, speak less. Like you don't always get to be, have an opinion or be the authority in the room or explain things or anything like that. Do more, meaning not just asking, you know, in in your scenario of, oh yeah, I guess there is dinner. Okay. Tell me exactly what to do, but can you get to a place you're actually like thinking ahead and -hmm. thinking, all right, I think these things will need to be done. So I will take the initiative to sort of do them in a way that doesn't ask my partner to be like my mother and say, okay, just tell me my chores for today and I'll do them. This is just a quick shameless plug. There is a resource that I found. Uh, I have a couple clients who have actually recommended it. It's the There's a book and a game. It's called Fair Play by Eve Rodansky. I believe there's also a documentary that goes along with it. But the there's the book and then the card game you actually do set out 
all of the tasks and start to look through like who does each task 100%. So start to finish. So yeah, you can make dinner, but did you think through what are the ingredients for dinner? And did you grocery shop for those? And did, you know, like these sorts of things. And so for those men who are interested in like, what does it mean to like do more and, and kind of forethought, like that could be a really great resource. Um, totally. just to get on that page, but yeah. So, um, one of the things that we talked about in one of our first episodes on purity culture, we, we started to touch a little bit on recognizing that purity culture does have racist roots and, um, there's, uh, I think obvious ways that this impacts women in particular and how women are objectified and hypersexualized as well as asexualized. Um, but I'm just kind of curious to know how you see this impacting men and maybe uh, like how messages uh, may be more directed at white men and instead of men of color or vice versa that we should just be aware of. Yeah. So I think purity culture, like most of American society, uh, Purity culture really takes as the standard and the ideal uh, the white heterosexual nuclear family. Okay, mm -hmm. and so you just mentioned how that works with with women. Um, I think with men, it's it's this situation where if you start to think of the men who are um, valued and revered in purity culture, you know, there at least in my case, and I've talked to many many men about this as well. It's usually a, a, a white man, right, who's a kind of leader in his community. Um, he's, uh, uh, maybe a pastor, uh, maybe, a, a some kind of doer. He's a, a mayor, a civic leader, uh, somebody who does things, but he's, he has two kids, right. And he probably wears flannel. Um, but he's looked at, as, <laughs> he's looked at as the ideal. Okay. And you might think on the surface, it's pretty benign, but what's underneath there is when you start to investigate, you're like, Hey, did you give me any examples of like the Asian man? the black man, who are also the scions of purity culture. And what you realize very quickly when you dig into the literature, when you dig into the histories, is that as with most of American history, black men are seen as threats who are most likely hypersexual and need even more than white men to be reined in because of their insatiable sexuality. Okay. So we get that message and it comes through. If you want to comb the archives of, of James, Dr. James Dobson and others, you, you will see those kinds of things come through in terms of their approach to race. Um, when it comes to Asian men, I'm an Asian American, there is a sense of erasure. If you talk to Asian men, they feel like they are invisible. They are not uh, somebody that gets seen uh, as a potential leader, as a Christian. You know, a lot of Asian American Christians will say, I wasn't a Christian. I was an Asian American Christian because even when I identified with my faith, I still I still had to use an adjective because I wasn't the norm. I wasn't the standard. Oh, you're an Asian Christian. You're not a Christian, right? And so I think what happens is when you graduate uh, or leave purity culture, a lot of those things that are been below the surface that you'd never reflected on come rushing to the fore. So for me. Uh, as an Asian American man, I, I remember emerging from purity culture and realizing I had a body and I was like, oh my God, my body's Asian. I'm Asian. Wow. Yeah. And I, I'm being facetious. I knew I was Asian, but what I'm getting at is there's all these stereotypes about Asian men and who, you know what roles they play in society, about their sexuality, about their attractiveness, about their, um, you know, their persona. Mm. So all of a sudden I got out of the whoosh of, of purity culture and what was been below all that was like this unexamined self-hatred about having an Asian body, right? And purity culture did nothing to diffuse that. If anything, it taught me that the men I looked up to and should try to be were again, those like white male leaders. And so I had no examples. I had no sense or no North star as like, oh, yeah, I'm a proud Asian man who does this, this, and this. I'm a proud Asian American who value, right? It was just years of like body self-hatred because I had a certain kind of body and a certain kind of, um, you know, presentation in the world and having to like go through all of that all over again, because I had never known, or I mean, I knew, but I had never reflected on or inhabited my body before that. 
Yeah. I think that's a really good point. I'm even reflecting back on like who were kind of like the big name leaders like in religion. I mean, we, we overlapped a lot in terms of our times as professional religious leaders and the only Asian American man I can think of is Francis Chan. Francis Chan. I know you were going to say it. Francis Chan. Yeah. That's it. And I loved him. Like he was funny and a bit like out there, which I appreciated because he wasn't John Piper. Yeah. Um, you know, but you know, when you've got people looking at John Piper as the Adonis, we yeah. got to, you know, like re re-examine, right? <laughs> John Piper, John MacArthur, right? These guys. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one I'll point out that people take for granted, and I'll just give you, I think he's the OG of this is Billy Graham. Um, we all remember Billy Graham as like an old man. Like Billy Graham has been, he's like Steve Martin. He's just in our mind. He's been an old man for a long time. Go back to Billy Graham in the, like the forties and fifties. That he was Striking. lifting weights. Yeah. He had a square jaw. He wanted to look like that Main Street hometown football quarterback guy. Like, and he intentionally did it, right? You know what I mean? So I think Billy Graham's like a, one of the pioneers of this sort of like, oh, the handsome white preacher guy. That's the dude. That's the dude you want to be. Not that, not the black man over there, not the Asian. You know what I mean? It's that guy. Yeah, when I started reading about Billy Graham more in depth, like in some of Sarah Mosliner's work and Kristen Cobes Dumay's work, I was like, oh, he's not the God is love guy. There's so much more beneath the surface. And when you look at the particularities of how he, who he targeted and the age that they were and why that age and this look and all these things, you start to recognize that, uh, you know, it's it's about control from the very, very beginning and ultimately, you know, purification of race. Um, and, and there's just so much more than just this pledge card that most people think about, you know, from 1994, 93, there's just more, more, way more than meets the eye. Yeah. So also curious to know, um, because one of my, one of my very good friends that he actually was on the podcast several episodes ago, we joke around, he's a gay man. He goes, I was the best purity culture boy ever. Right. Because I thought I was doing something right. Because of course, you know, I'm not, I'm, I don't need to be blind because I'm not attracted to women, you know, like that whole thing. Right. Um, and so we can chuckle about it now, but I also know that there, you know, that that can be a huge source of shame for men in purity culture who are not attracted uh, to the prescribed partner, which is mm-hmm. women in that in that uh, system. So, yeah, I'm just curious to know if you have any thoughts just on the impact of of men who are part of the LGBTQ community, whether they were closeted or out during their time in purity culture and the impact of that. Yeah. And, and, and I don't want to speak here as somebody who uh, I don't identify, uh, identify sure. as a straight man. And so I don't want to yeah. speak here as somebody who's um, speaking from an insider's perspective as part of the uh, LGBTQ community, what I'll say, working with clients and um, just the ways that I've studied these things for 20 years now is um, all of the shame we've talked about, yeah. all of the sense of hating your body, all of the sense of not feeling like you're a real man in God's eyes, the church's eyes, the the guys at church, you know, the way they see you, that is just cascaded onto somebody if they are a gay person, if they're a bi person, if they are uh, non-binary, if they're a- asexual. Like I've talked to clients who are like, I'm asexual. <laughs> like mm-hmm. I don't, none of this made sense to me. Yeah. Um, and so the sense of, here's what it boils down to. Purity culture tells you that you're made in the image of God. And we're going to talk all the time about how that the components of that image, in terms of your sex, in terms of your 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 role, your gendered role, and these are the things we're going to hone in on. So when you don't fit, and I'm talking as like I'm a straight guy who like his senior year of high school opted out of the the games at summer camp so he could read Thomas Aquinas in the cabin. Okay. And I felt, yeah, I know, just whew, a lot of fan mail coming my way. I'm, yeah. Um, so, and I felt like I don't, I, I don't fit in. I'm not, I'm not a real dude here. I want to go read Thomas Aquinas, right? When I go talk to my friends from those era, when I talk to clients, and they're like, "Yeah, I was gay. I, mm. I was asexual. I was non-binary." Like the sense of shame, the sense of. I am not what I'm supposed to be cascades upon you. And it is so hard to square that circle with how God sees you and how you see and feel yourself. It's just impossible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think about, you know, 
you mentioned Billy Graham. And then of course, nowadays, like from the 2000s onward, you know, we have this idea of manliness as John Wayne and William Wallace or Braveheart or whatever, Mm -hmm. when that prototype is not met, um, that has to be confusing and shaming for most men, I would think. Um, yeah. And I, th- I think it is, f- I think it, you know, I think what I've discovered working with so many men is like, it, it is a, it, even the people that you think are doing youth group and purity culture, right. Mm. The, the guys who play sports, the guys who are really into building things and whatever, whatever you're supposed to be in that culture, they're usually faking it. They're usually like masking somehow. Now, transfer all of that to that person who's like, I am right queer. I have no way to live up to this image. I'm not even going to be able to try. What am I supposed to do here? And then we talked about culture at large earlier. So it's like, all right, I don't fit into the typical American dude. All right, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. What if the God who created you sees you as not what you're supposed to be? It adds a layer, a cosmic layer, a metaphysical layer that you can't ever like escape or or break through and that's um, that that's the uh, the real essence of it. Yeah, I can I can echo that in terms of the clients I've worked with um that just yeah, really that that's part of their deconstruction, their own shame that they're navigating through and it can just be it's it's a, incredibly difficult and heart-wrenching too to not only hear about it but to live that. I I can only imagine what that's like. Yeah. So, you know, as we kind of start to wrap up, I'm, um, I'm going to go back to that purity culture group that you led about, you know, a year and a half, two years ago or whatnot. And I just wondered if you might feel okay to share some of the themes that you noticed coming out of that group, um, just in regard to some of the things that they were working through, or maybe, maybe some of the things that the guys in that group found to be helpful, um, in their recovery process, what was meaningful to them? Yeah, I think one, so there's a couple of things. I think one is that we haven't touched on today, which is emotions. And I think that part of what purity culture does is teach you that the only emotion that men show is anger, righteous anger, righteous indignation. That could be at injustice in the world, or it could be at your wife in the parking lot at Target, right? And and so if you show anger, it's godly. If you show sadness, disappointment, sorrow, it is something else. It's 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 unbecoming of a real man. Mm. Part of the recovery that we talked about a lot in that group was I had to learn to share emotions um, that were not anger and to th- know that that was a good thing and to know that my partner was not going to see me as less of something, but mm-hmm. was going to appreciate me actually communicating my feelings. And that requires so much inventory, so mm-hmm. much practice, so much exercise to even be able to feel the feelings communicate them to someone else is a huge process. So yeah. I think I think that's um I think that's a big thing. I also mm-hmm. think that just on that that uh, theme of communication, um there was a real emphasis on um it felt it feels weak to say what I want. Mm. Yeah. Because we're supposed to take, we're supposed to make, we're supposed to do. And so for me to express what I want mm-hmm. and that could be when it comes to like a big life decision, like a job change, that could be like what it is I want for dinner. That could be um, what I want in the bedroom. But like just to say, I need this, I would like this, um, felt like for so many of the guys in the group, including me, like something we had never learned and was holding back our relationships in ways that um, we many of us had noticed. So I think that was I think that was a big part of it too. It strikes me, I, and I've seen this in other ways too. It strikes me as so interesting that a lot of women say, I have no vocabulary to express how, like what I want either. It's coming maybe from like a different motivating factor and yet the same result is happening. And I think it's so interesting how the areas where we are kind of like stunted uh, developmentally, relationally, communicatively is the same, you know, like between, uh, you know, like it doesn't matter what gender you are. It doesn't necessarily matter background. It's like 
We were not taught these skills. In fact, we were taught to use this against the other person Mm -hmm. um, that we're in relationship with. And it's just, yeah, I'm just kind of sitting with that for a minute. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I I think, and and I'm happy to be incorrect. So correct me here. But like, my sense is that, you know, there's a sense of erasure of agency for women. They're like, I don't know what Mm -hmm. I want because I was taught I was supposed to just want whatever my husband or the church told me to want. Mm -hmm. I think with the men I spoke to, it was like, um, it felt weak to express my desire. Yeah. It also felt like if that included emotions mm-hmm. that were not anger, then that felt effeminate in the church's eyes. And I want to, I was supposed to be this masculine leader. So for me to express disappointment, for me to express sensitivity or hurt in it. And we could be talking about some major life event, but we could also just be talking about like, you know, what happened with the mis- miscommunication about the meal or what happened at the kid's school or the drop off or the, you know, who was going to pick up the grocery, something that that was something that like, there was no exercises for that. There was no role model, no dad that was like really good at sort of just, you know, saying to partner or to kids, Hey, like what's happening here? Like, let me know. Here's what I need right now. Like the lexicon of here's what I need right now. Um, how does that feel for you in this moment? Like, you know, that sounds so simple, but like, goodness, that's not a thing that the cultures we're talking about ever show you. I think you're you're right on this. So what it seems to me, like the short way is women are taught to disconnect from wants and I just defer to the man in my life. Men were taught, here's the prescription of what you want. And if you want anything outside of that, we don't, we're not going to teach you tools for how to get that. We're not going to actually show you that. And in fact, it probably means you're not actually like manly equal godly, right? Yeah. So nobody is, is getting what they want or need or truly desire. Everything is based on control. Once again, yeah, there it is. Yeah, I, that's that's just such a beautiful summation. That was awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm just curious to know: are there any uh, go to resources or interventions, approaches, you know, websites, whatever that you kind of recommend on this topic? If there's men who are like, I, I'm really resonating with this. Uh, I need to know more. Yeah, yeah, there's not a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, true. <laughs> I think um, you know. I think that one one encouragement I would I would give to any man who's interested in purity culture is start reading what there is available because um, we all have a lot to learn. So um, I'm always going to tell men go read Linda K. Klein's Pure, go read Sarah Mosner's work, go read Julie Ingersoll's work. Go read Laura Anderson's work because, um, you know, what we need to do is take stock of purity culture and what it looks like from all angles. And you're going to learn a lot uh, when you digest and and interpret what all of this meant to the girls and the women in your life. You're going to start to see the system as a whole. And you're going to start to see all the messages and all the symbols that it sort of sent to people, right? And then you're going to be able to sort of start pushing putting that back on you and saying, okay, so what role did I have in that system? What kind of cog was I in that machine? What kind of cog was I taught to be to make the machine keep going? What kind of person makes purity culture go and operate? Well, it's the kind of man who does this, this, and this. All right. Well, where am I at that now? Um, And I think going down those roads are really, um, are really, really good. And I think they're really, really helpful. Um, So I, I, yeah. Anyway, I'll leave it there. There's more to say, but yeah. I can I can't speak for all women. I can speak only for myself. I do know that uh whoever is in the more oppressed position in any given topic or whatnot is the one who has to do more of the emotional labor to exist. <laughs> right. Um, and so there can be this like dauntedness. I, and I feel for this. I I have a, a good male friend of mine who's like we weren't taught any tools and that's a fair, like that is an accurate assessment. Mm -hmm. And um, what I'll say, what I said to him and I will say to anybody else is if you're in relationship with me as a male and you're actively seeking out, what is my role in this? How do I need to shift? How do I need to change? I will have conversations with you all day long 
because you're the person I'm interested in talking to because I know you're doing something about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would venture to say that there's other people out there like that as well. Yeah. That yeah. They go, as long as I see you doing the work and this earnest like curiosity, I will meet you in that. Mm -hmm. uh, that feels less burdensome than the person who's like, what do you mean? Just tell me. And I'm like, mm -mm, nope, <laughs> that's who I'm not having conversations with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Which, yeah, I will. I, I love those conversations so long as they're not falling on deaf ears. Well, and I think, I think it, it's a challenge to think about it as, um, you know, if you're recovering from period culture as a man, um, there's, there's two things at play. One, uh, you need to understand what this does to the, the girls and women and what it did to the girls and women in your life. And, and as a whole, um, in order to understand all the pain and the hurt that these systems like propagate in the world. So that is, that is a, a motivation in itself. The other motivation is if you don't heal from period of culture yourself, if you don't think it's important enough to do, if you don't think that it's a priority, if it's not something you want to pay attention to, you're going to keep repeating the same harmful patterns that in yourself, you yourself will continue to be frustrated and inhibited in various ways. And your relationships will continue to suffer as a result. Could be your kids, could be your partner, could be your friends, could be your ability. And, and you could be your ability to have friends of the opposite sex. Something peer to cultures like doesn't think is possible, right? It could be your ability to relate to colleagues in your workplace or a superior who is a woman. Like there's so many ways. It doesn't just have to be your spouse, your partner, your eight-year-old or whatever. And and I think to me that is that is huge and and that's really really important. Yeah. Oh, that's so well said. So the last question that we ask everybody is, is there anything else that you wish we would ask you today or anything else that you would want to share? Um, I I am a big proponent of when we recover from period of culture, men and women, we recover from the ways that it programs sex. So sex is always the headline, right? Um, then it's gender, right? The gender rules. Okay. And we talked a lot about that today. I think what we don't talk about um, enough is love. And because the idea for peer to culture, for Christian culture at large, for a lot of Western culture is love will solve you. God is your soulmate and God has picked you a soulmate. And as long as you have both soulmates, you will be complete and fulfilled and you'll want for nothing. You will have the perfect match, your other half. And I think when you die, when you deconstruct purity culture, you have to deconstruct love because if you think love will solve you, if you think you have another half, you're still in purity culture, even if you haven't been in a church in 15 years, period. That is so powerful. That is so powerful. Um, have you watched the Netflix documentary, Twin Flames Universe? I, my partner watched it and I watched okay. enough of like watching, walking in the room all day, you know, I, so I have the idea. I saw some of the most cringy scenes <laughs> yeah. uh, possible, but I have not watched the entire thing. But that, that's what it is. I actually wrote a sub stack on it. Like uh, whenever it came out, I said, this is how Twin Flames Universe and Purity Culture are mm -hmm. two sides of the same coin. It's exactly what you said there. Yeah. And uh, this Disney. idea of completeness. Yes, love. And so long as we love each other, we're good. We don't have to do any more work than that. I, I, oh, that is a conversation we need to keep having for sure. Yeah. Maybe that's another episode, but yes, keep preaching. <laughs> well, I just, I know we got to sign off. I'll just say yeah. the, the human condition is not, is it's not one you can solve. We have a condition yes. that is irresolvable. We have a condition that is incurable. So being human is not about solving yourself. Being human is about living and thriving with that condition in ways that are always going to be vulnerable and always going to be tenuous, but can also be full of joy and wonder. But purity culture, when it comes to love, Disney, the soulmate myth, it's like this. If you find the one, they'll solve you. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't deconstruct love, you'll never get out of purity culture. God, you are just blowing my mind. All right. I'm going to have to go like have a journaling session after this. <laughs> this time I'm paying you. So, <laughs> uh, well, Brad, I'm so glad you could be with us today. Where can people find you if they're interested in following your work um, or social media or anything like that? 
Yeah, best place on this topic is uh, my podcast, Straight White American Jesus. And I actually did uh, a whole series called Mild at Heart. So you can go to straightwhiteamericanjesus.com, type in mild at heart with an M. And uh, there's seven or eight episodes on love, masculinity, and sex after purity culture. So you can find those there. You can also find interviews on purity culture with Dr. Laura Anderson, Dr. Sarah Mosliner, uh, and and many other, uh, Erica Smith. Uh, many others. So um, check that out. Uh, and otherwise, you can find us on online at Bradley Unishi or Straight White JC. I love it. Brad, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. Okay. And thank you once again to Brad Onishi for joining us today. Just such an amazing conversation. I think there were so many other you know, kind of rabbit trails that we could have gone down, but I'm just so glad that we were able to have a conversation that we don't normally get to have. And that really is the whole men and purity culture piece. I really appreciate Brad's uh, depth and breadth of knowledge, how he understands, um, you know, the impact of purity culture kind of on a global general level, as well as some of the specifics as it pertains to gender, race, and sexuality. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I'm so excited for the work that he ha- has been doing and is continuing to do. If you have not checked out his um, series through the Straight White American Jesus podcast, which is called Mild at Heart, which of course is a play off of John Eldridge's Wild at Heart, I would highly encourage you to do that regardless of gender. It's just such an interesting um podcast series. And then of course he has other, uh, uh, episodes within the straight white American Jesus, um, podcast archives about purity culture. So please make sure to go check those out. Um, I am excited for our next episode as well, where we will be talking to another amazing individual who grew up male in purity culture and did all of this amazing deconstruction, religious trauma healing work around his experience. And so we will be hearing from him what was helpful and where he's at today. So please make sure to tune in for that. And then of course, next month, we will be focusing on women's experiences in purity culture and have some amazing interviews for you then as well. So as always, have a wonderful day and be blessed.